filled in majestic mountains. Liquid death mountain water will murder your thirst. <sighs> My name is Aaron Micklow, and I'm here with Joe from The Queers. How's it going? Oi, oi, oi. <laughs> Just getting into the swing of things here at Rebellion Fest. <laughs> actually started your European tour earlier this month. You kicked off in Mexico, came over to Europe. Can you share some of your most memorable stories from being on the road this month? Well, bad tacos in Monterey. The <laughs> promoter was a doctor and MD. I was like, you gotta be kidding me, dude. But anyway, uh, no, we had a good show there. That was our first time in Monterey, Mexico. So that was good. Uh, then we did Italy, a couple of festivals. Reduno, we headlined that. It was pretty cool. We had a good time. We haven't been back in five years. So when we lay off for a few years, we do pretty good. Um, we used to do the festival circuit and come every year during the summer, but we just kind of stopped that. So I don't know. It's a blur. You know, going on tour is like, you know, a mentally retarded version of Outward Bound where you're just like, <laughs> dude, you know, just try to get back with half the brain cells you left with. So yeah, <laughs> sure. it's been fun. You know, we're in Germany, Holland, and now we're over here for this is the last show in the UK. And then we're off to Belgium, Finland and Italy. So. Yeah, cool. so I don't know. I, you know, next week, talk to me when I'm home, and then I'll have some stories. I don't know what happened. I'm just like going hotel, crawling, dragging ass right now at yeah. this point of the tour. It's going great, though. We've had great shows. So Yeah, when you get yeah. home, you kind of have that time to, to reflect on things and be like, wow, that was a, a really shitty moment, or that was a really great moment. Well, it's funny. Like, I've got a studio at my house, so... Um, I just found out I've got a band coming in from California. I think we land Tuesday. They, they come in Wednesday night. So I was like, oh, shit, I don't have much time off. But going on tour, it's, it's pretty funny because, you know, you're out here and you're like signing autographs and you play and people are cheering and like more, more and all this. And it's pretty cool. And then I go home and it's just, you know, my wife's like, you know, how much money you make? You know, give me the money and blah, blah, blah. You know, go feed the chickens and all that shit. <laughs> We got four chickens. So it's a real difference between my life out here and back home. I mean, when I'm home, I got the social life of a 93-year-old man, you know. <laughs> Worry about the tomatoes and my four chickens and stuff. But uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. So I yeah. like it. It keeps, uh, it keeps my, our feet on the ground. We don't, you know, we don't never get too, too, big, a heads, uh, too big heads about the whole thing, you know. For so sure. Conceited, so. So since you just have a recording studio at your place, I saw that you're getting ready to record a new Queers album. Yeah. How far along are you in the process, and is there a theme to the album? Not to. <laughs> <laughs> I've been so busy with other bands. I just go word of mouth, and bands I meet on tour, like, I don't know. I might meet a band today. I'm like, hey, come on in. Um, I try to, like, find bands. I only go word of mouth, so it's kind of like a private studio for musicians. I could run it for commercially, but I don't. But I just go word of mouth. And if I see some band opening up, I really try to find bands that are kind of unknown and they've got that spark, you know, where they're just starting out. Maybe you're, they're a younger band, but they, you know, some bands you just look at them. This band we met out in um, Portland, Oregon, Bad Sex. And, you know, I just saw them and I know they, they're good. Check them out. And I go, God, those guys, you know, I talked to them and I, I just knew they felt they were the best, greatest band in the rock and roll band in the world, you know, and I was like, damn, that's great. I want to record you guys. So they're coming in. So, but um, yeah, the whole thing's pretty good. Now, music I like, I love having the studio because um, with music, I've been doing it now for years, but it always gives you something to get out of bed in the morning for. It's like the yeah. arts. 
Yeah. Um, I, I owned a restaurant for five years. I love that too, the creativity, but um, music, I like the energy. You know, someone's calling you up. When's the drummer getting in? What's Cheeto, the bass player? What's going on with him? And there's always something to get out of bed for. Yeah. As far as the new album, I'm so busy in the studio. So we do have the name. I don't want to say it now because it's so killer. I'm afraid someone will steal it. But um, we're going to, yeah, we're going to get in there later this year when we slow down. That's exciting. But the queers, we don't ask. I tell my booking agent, don't go looking for gigs. <laughs> they all come to us. And I just got an email yesterday. He's like, dude, we got... 32 more shows and counting to the end of the year. I go, fuck, dude. So I don't know when we're going to do that album. I've got a book half finished. I haven't finished that one either. been like recording a new album like what when you sit down and say okay it's time to make a new record what's your process the way we record now we used to have the songs all mapped out but now it's more because I own the studio we'll take probably a month and we'll work a few days here and a few days there and we'll get the drums down and then get guitars and then the cool thing having the studio is that um, we can listen to it and say oh we like that let's redo this yeah. Let's do the drums over. Let's do a different arrangement. So it yeah. does take longer. Um, however, you know, it, it, it always kills me to hear these like big rock bands and indie bands. They're like, oh, we've been working for two years on our album. And you're like, what the fuck do you do for two years? Exactly. I mean, the, I mean how you can you even get into it? <laughs> exactly. Right. I mean, and, you're um, a different person from the starting exactly point right. to the end point. And how do you keep the excitement going? So... Um, <laughs> But yeah, so that's we were working a little slower as far as the way we're the process because I own the studio and we're able to do it, which is a luxury. Yeah. But um, where it used to cost us five hundred bucks a day, so now it's just for free. And which and, is nice. and and because I own the studio, a lot of these younger bands, no name bands, um, they ain't got no money and they can't record. And I'm like, oh dude, come on in. I dude, I was there. I understand. Yeah. In the old days, we would have like say three hundred bucks. We'd go in the studio. And we'd have four hours, mm -hmm. except we'd spend money on booze and coke, and so we'd have like about 180 yeah. out of the 400. So we'd never want to piss off the engineer because we were 200 bucks short anyway. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to just like tune up, and then if you started and stopped together, you know that's all. We didn't care about like you know how the take was. It was yeah. just like yo, no, yeah, we didn't. You know, it started and stopped together. It was like taking a flight. As long as the takeoff and landing was okay, we didn't care what happened in the air. That's how we recorded. You know, nobody cared. Our love songs for the retarded, we did that album in 18 hours. Nobody gives a fuck that it wasn't, that it was kind of sloppy. Yeah. So. Um, well, it was punk rock, you know. Exactly. It was, it, <laughs> you know, drummer was junked out, so he could only come in. He was on the methadone clinic, I think, at the time. So we only had him for like 14 hours or something. But it lends a certain immediacy to it. Now, when we started, like, bands like Green Day, Screeching Weasel, The Muffs, Mighty Boss, Tones, um, you know, Queers, we didn't have safety nets under us. It was just, like, punk rock or Welcome to Burger King, May I Take Your Order. Yeah. And now it kind of got, you know, Rebellion Fest. You know, it's really a career move where bands can, people can get in bands and make money and make a career out of it. And, but when we started out, it wasn't like that. You played for the love of the music. Yeah. And, um... Mighty Mighty Boston's Green Day. They were playing that great music back then before they hit it big. And they were going to play whether they hit it big or whether they ended up playing small gigs at the Rat in Boston for the Boston's or Bottom of the Hill for Green Day. They, you know, they were into it, man. It yeah. was something inside them. It wasn't a career move. That's how it always was with us. I just always wanted to play music. It's weird. I played trumpet. When I was a little kid, I wanted to play trumpet. I played that in a band and I just love music, so it's yeah. weird. But it was a dream come true. It's what I wanted to do in high school, play music. And here I am 30 years later, and, and you know, it's like I, I think this is great. I love it. So um, I, I love the energy, and I love being part of, uh, 
you know, it, at least on the fringes of, of stuff like this. It's great. Yeah, and so. I think that's so important to, you know, to really feel passionately about playing the music and to be there for those reasons. I mean, I like, when we started out, everybody had a fanzine. Everybody yeah. had a fanzine, and this is just a little extension. You guys yeah. are an extension of that. I love it. Technology I love the podcast. has changed, so this is the fanzine it, of 2018. It, it, right, and I love it. I love the energy and the fact you're taking your time out of your, your day. You're over here, far from home, and, and you know making this happen for bands, doing interviews. It's great. I love it. It's, it's all yeah. part of the whole whole scene so it's great i yeah. i admire that it's so. a community and you know like yeah. without the music that you're putting out there you know fan, fans like myself it's like where would we be what do we have you know <laughs> well with music people go oh what do you like about music i go hey man when i started out yeah i wanted to get laid and i wanted to like do drugs and i wanted to party <laughs> and all that but you know i also wanted to travel around the world and meet people and, and make friends all over the place and i can move to boise or i could move to seoul South yeah. Korea or or Anchorage, Alaska or wherever, Milan, and I would have friends because of music. And yeah. you can't put a price tag on that. Yeah. And getting to rub elbows with people and seeing how their lives are and how they live and what makes the world go round. So it's been quite an education. Yeah. And um, so I, I love that about it too. But yeah, I, I don't take it for granted. I, I tell my guys in my band, I go, hey man, I... I know I'm lucky to be able to play music and make a living off this. You know, it's how I met my wife. It's all of a sudden I woke up one day and everybody in my life I met through music. Mm -hmm. I, I feel the I, same I, way. I got two or three friends from high school and that I'll see once in a while. But no, I met my wife through music. I met my band through music. It, every it was weird, but that's how it all trickled down. It was all through music. So it's been a pretty exciting ride, and I'm surprised we're still playing. But hey, man, it's going good. <laughs> worked with Joey Ramone on his solo album what was that like working together I, all I did with him was was listen to the songs he was doing and he asked me if I wanted to work on songs for his album yeah so I didn't unfortunately I would have loved to but um I got to know him I wasn't best friends with him evil from the independents he was a really good friend of him I didn't know him like Daniel Ray and all that stuff but we I got yeah. to know him pretty well the last three years of his life or so and he asked me to I remember he called me on a Saturday and he said, hey, Joe, it's Joey. Uh, I got a couple <laughs> songs I want you to hear from the solo album. I said, oh, cool. I go, what, what is it? He goes, what, uh, what a wonderful world. And I go, because I played trumpet in the band uh -huh. and then I played in the jazz band in high school and shit. I go, the Louis Armstrong song? Are you shitting me? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I go, dude, I got to hear this. And I was blown away about how good it was. Yeah. And, um, then Maria Bartiromo, he played that. I remember that it was a Saturday morning, and I was at my folks' house, and uh, he held his phone up to the speaker, and I listened to it. It was pretty. I was blown away. But he said, "I need stronger songs for the album," which yeah. I really thought was pretty telling in a guy that famous. Where he said to me, "He goes, listen, people are gonna blow smoke up my ass and say, oh, I love the whole album. It's better than Rocket to Russia and blah blah." He goes, "But I know I need stronger songs." He goes, there's Maria Bartiromo and What a Wonderful World. And then he goes, Mr. Punchy's cool, but it's not in the same league. And yeah. I thought that was really telling of a guy that famous that he was that honest with himself. Yeah. And I always remembered that. And he goes, hey, man, you know, I don't need to read a review to know if it's a good album or not. Yeah. Um, so uh, I always took that. I, I always remembered that from Joey. Anyway, he had asked me to work on songs years ago. It's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing. But years ago, he'd sent us a cassette tape of Slug, the song Slug. This is like the mid-'80s. The Ramones weren't song. that much older than me. So um, he wanted to cover Love, 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 a queer mm -hmm. song. We had sent him a cassette tape. We would always see them backstage in Boston, and they would play Boston all the time. And they're, you know, we'd always meet them. So he said, send me a tape. So we sent him a tape. Yeah. He said, I love Goodbye California, Love, Love, Love by the queers. I'd love to do Love, Love, Love. Oh, wow, cool. I'm going to let you guys, I got a song you guys should do that Johnny didn't want to use on End of the Century called Slug. Mm -hmm. This is like 85. 
So there was no unreleased Ramon songs at the time. We knew everything. Yeah. Um, I, there now was just there is. no it's like a million. Right, right. There's all sorts of outtakes. No, back then, forget it. So, so he sent us a cassette tape, Slug, and we listened to it at our rehearsal space. I remember it was a white cassette. We listened to it, drinking beer, listened to it, like, oh, this song's fucking cool, man. Yeah. And then on the cassette tape, it was him playing acoustic guitar, and he was working on a song. It was him at his house singing this song, I Want to Be Happy. Mm hmm. And it was just the verse, I want to be happy, I don't want to be bad, I want to be happy, I don't want to be sad, I want to be happy, I want to be happy, so bad, bow, na 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 na, I played guitar with one finger. I always remember that idea, and I said, dude, when he asked me years later to work on songs, I said, do you remember that song, I want to be happy? He goes, yes, I do, my God, I forgot all about that. I yeah. said, dude, you sent us the tape, it was on that, he goes, you got to be shitting me. I go, no. And so, anyway, me and Ben Weasel took that song and we did a bridge and chorus and we finished the song. You know, it was going to be for Joey's solo album, but by the time we finished, it was, um, it was just too, it was too late. He was yeah. too sick. And I don't think I ever talked to him after we had finished it finally, which sucked. It would have been a killer song if you listened to it off the Queer's Pleasant Screams album. Um, it was, uh, would have been a killer song for him to sing on that album, I Want to Be Happy. But anyway, that's as close as we got. We don't kind of push the fact that he wrote it. But he wrote, you know, part of that song. So it's kind of cool, you know. And it yeah. came out good. The song really came out good, too. And I like to think that he would have loved it and sung it well. So um, Well, and that is cool because, you know, there are people that say the queers are similar to the Ramones. And that's obviously yeah. why. Yeah. Well, yeah, people would... We, we're Ramones influenced us and Screeching Weasel, but people yeah. would not listen to us and, and mistake us for the Ramones. Exactly. Like some bands are just yeah. so close. They're yeah. like, fuck, man, is this the Ramones? But uh, Joey told me we had done our Don't Back Down album, and he liked the fact that we did the Beach Boys vocals with the Ramones chords. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's something I always wanted to do, and I never got to, into doing it too much. So... Um, we had talked about doing a four-song EP with Joey singing. He was segueing out of the Ramones at this point. I can't yeah. remember the exact year, but I said, dude, how about if we be your band? And we were doing really well yeah. at the time. And you sing. So it's going to be Joey Ramone with the Queers. You sing lead vocals. And so we had talked about doing that. And um, that never got off the ground because I, at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I should have jumped on it and gone in the studio it, like three weeks later. Instead, I was like, oh, I'll just do it next year. And then he got sick and we couldn't do it. That's so sad. But... That would have been cool. The cool thing was, though, I had talked to Joey and I said, listen, how about doing like a three part harmony song, like a Beach Boys in my room song where it's like three harmonies. And he was getting we we're talking about some songs off Don't Back Down, the Queers album, where we had Lisa Mars sing this song, I Can't Get Over You. And we had three vocals going and it was slower. And he said, yeah, that's great. That's exactly. People want to hear Beat on the Brad or, you know, Rockaway Beach. And I want to, we're going to come out with me, Joey, and a female vocalist. We're talking about Kim from the Muffs. But anyway, um, I like that adventurous. He goes, that's coming out of left field. You know, it's breaking new yeah. ground. That's what I want to do. I don't want to do Beat on the Brad. I want to, like, do something different. Yeah. And what a wonderful world was different, too. It was really, very when different. you get down to it. And right. it, was a, it was a great cover. I mean, that song killer, is. Killer. Killer. And, mean, and so inventive. I said, dude, I never would have thought of covering that song in a million years. And so, yeah, he, I like that. And I learned, you know, he was the one who said, don't just, so many of these bands stay punk for the sake of staying punk. Instead of like branching out and trying different stuff, like we did on Don't Back Down, um, where we had a girl singing, Lisa Marr sang a song. And. It just we did a song in six eight time and and so I just like doing that experimenting. You're not gonna hit a home run every time, yeah. but more often than not, it's worked out. For that from Joey he was pretty inspirational to me yeah he really was I'll tell you another story about him we sent him the cassette tape of four of our songs goodbye California love 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 okay. and two other songs so about two months later I'm at the University of New Hampshire seeing the Ramones yeah I bullshit my way backstage <laughs> 
I said I was Richard Hell's cousin. I still remember that. And the guys were so stupid. They're like, oh, yeah. I go, yeah, I'm Richard Hell from the Voidoids. It's my cousin. I know the Joey and Monty. So I got backstage, and Monty's like, that's not Richard Hell's cousin. <laughs> it was pretty funny. And I go, hey, Joey, it's Joe from the Queers. And Joey's like, oh, Monty, it's cool. But he came right up out of the blue, and he goes, I got to tell you, I love, 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 and goodbye, California. I love to cover love, love, love. And it meant so much to me. I still get goosebumps, man, Aww. thinking about it because... He, you know, he came up, I just said, hey, it's Joe from the Queers, and like, he didn't know me to look at me, but he remembered we'd always meet, and, and I had sent him the tape, and he loved the songs, and he came up and mentioned the song titles, and I was like, oh, dude, yes, and so it meant a lot to me. I told his mom after he died how much it meant to me. Yeah. So, yeah. So I mean, he was, meant uh, a lot to a lot of people, myself yeah. included. Yes, absolutely, so. and they always, all those guys, CJ, Richie, I just talked to Richie today, actually, yeah. and um, all of them couldn't be nicer. Marky, I played guitar for him for a while. Uh, very down to earth. They were all into just the music and all that stuff. So I learned a lot from them. They were my favorite band. But uh, Joey, especially, even though I wasn't best friends, I learned quite a lot from him. So uh, yeah. yeah, the first time we ever played for the with the Ramones, it was a huge show, mm -hmm. like about four thousand people. This is like back in the mid '80s, roughly right after he sent us the tape for yeah. uh, Slug. So we'd never played in front of like we never toured. We weren't on Lookout Records or anything. We're just some local Boston band. We sucked. And so, but the Ramones got us on that gig at the Agora Ballroom in Hartford, Connecticut. And it was like 4,000 people or 3,000. I mean, it's just yeah. like 10,000 of us. We never even played. We would usually get 40 people if we played. Never yeah. mind 400, but 4,000, forget it. That's a big show. I was shaking like a dog passing a peach pit. And so all of us were, were like, we didn't know how to open up for a, you know, we were used to being in the audience. But to get up on the stage in front of like a million people is like, are you kidding me? I don't know what to do. We played every song we knew and some we didn't. We sucked. I mean, finally they sent out a roadie. We would have been up there. We are just frozen in fear playing like Louie Louie for the third time. And it was like, finally someone pulled us off. But Joey told me that night, he goes, listen, he knew he didn't know shit from a fucking hole in the ground. He said, dude, when you open up for bands, play your best 22 minutes. Yeah. And the crowd appreciates it, and the stage guys appreciate it, and the promoter appreciates it, and the headlining band appreciates it. And I never forgot that. Yeah. And to this day, we'll have bands open up at small shows, Star Bar in Atlanta, and the opening band will play 53 minutes. And you're like, dude, you lost them 30 minutes ago. Yeah. Get off stage. I never forgot the 22-minute rule. Keep it short and sweet. Because Joey told me, he said, dude, we would do the 22-minute thing because they would throw bottles at us. Yeah. When the Ramones would open up in the early days for, like, Johnny Winters was one band who told me they opened up for real rock and roll redneck stuff, and these people yeah. wouldn't know what the fuck they were about. So it was like, he goes, when we got our stage, he goes, well, at least they didn't throw bottles. I remember him laughing. I go, fuck, you know. So I never forgot that stuff. So, Aww. yeah, it was, pretty, it was pretty fun. So uh, he was a good guy. But it's That's funny, so the little life lessons that you... You, I was from New Hampshire and very insecure, so I was sucking up anything, anybody, you know, yeah. especially be people I looked up to and had bigger life lessons they had learned from traveling around the world than I had at that point. So I listened to everything. So For sure. Yeah, I mean, I meet a lot of kids now and they just think with the Internet and everything, they know it all. And it's just like, dude, man, you know, I, I tell the guys that my younger guys in my band, they're going, what's the one message you could tell us? If you gave me advice, what is it? I said, be teachable. Drop yeah. the ego and be teachable. Yeah. My buddy Dusty Watson, who drums for the Sonics, he was in Concrete Blonde, Dick Dale, he drummed for him, surf drummer extraordinaire. You know, we talk about it. I learned from him. He's played with us. And he was telling me, you know, I always try to learn off these guys. Yeah. He, and I go, you do, Dusty? Because he's such a great drummer. And uh, he goes, yeah. And, and if I've got the attitude that I'm as good as everybody else, I'm never going to improve. And I go, fuck, man, that's, that's right. Because he said so many right. drummers learn how to play and then they get proficient and then they think they're as good as everybody else. And the only reason they're not on stage with ACDC or whoever is because they're not as lucky. And that has nothing to do with it. You got to keep moving forward. So I tell my guys that. I said, that's what Dusty told me. And I keep that in mind, too. I always try to move forward. Yeah. Me more, it's more songwriting now, but um, it's, it's really a good lesson. I, I could tell younger people, be teachable, drop the ego, yeah. and, and, and you'll learn, and you'll get better. So, yeah. Yeah, but uh, so that's, that's kind of, you know, still going. It keeps me going, that, that stuff, to still try to improve in songwriting and, and playing and everything. So For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories with me tonight. I try to fuck
Thank you.